7.4, Exponential Growth and Decay, our last section that we need to cover for the AP exam. Law of Natural Growth and Decay. Earlier, we assumed that population grew at a rate proportional to the size of the population. This assumption applies in many other situations as well. For example, the mass of a radioactive substance decays at a rate proportional to the mass. In general, if y at t is the value of a quantity y at a time t, and the rate of change of y with respect to t is proportional to the size y at t at any time, then we can say that dy dt equals ky because it's proportional to the y where k is a constant. This is called the law of natural growth if k is greater than zero or the law of natural decay if k is less than zero. If we have dy dt equals ky, now we can solve it as a separable differential equation based on what we learned in the last section. So we have dy dt equals ky, get all the y stuff on the left and everything else on the right and so now we'll take the antiderivative of both sides. The antiderivative of 1 over y is just ln absolute value of y. The antiderivative of k, constant kt plus c. And so we do e to both sides. We're left with the absolute value of y equals e to the kt plus c, which is the same thing as e to the kt times e to the c. So we can say y equals a e to the kt, where we let a equal plus or minus e to the c. Note, this means that a is the initial value of the function, or y not, which we've seen before. And so population growth, what is the significance of the proportionality constant k? In the context of population growth, we knew that dp dt equals kp. In other words, if we solve for k, we get 1 over p dp dt. So the quantity 1 over p dp dt is called the relative growth rate. Notice that the relative growth rate appears as a coefficient of t in the exponential function because we had that population equals y naught e to the kt and so k we just said was the relative growth rate and so the relative growth rate is always going to be the coefficient of the t. Example 1 Assuming that the growth rate is proportional to the population size, use the data to model the population of the world in the 20th century. What is the relative growth rate? How well does the model fit the data? So let us just let year 1900 be our initial year. So let t equals 0 correspond to 1900 so that we say that the initial population is 1650 because they told us that the initial population is 1650. So then we have dp dt equals kp means that the population after two years is y naught, which is 1650, e to the kt. So let's just pick another point. And I'm just going to first pick this year. So in the year 1950, our t is 50, so the point is 50, 2560. Don't forget, the year is 50 because we let t equal 0 correspond to the year 1900. And so then we would get y equals 1650e to the k, and our t is 50. And so now just divide both sides by 1650, and we would get 2560 over 1650 equals e to the 50k. Take the ln of both sides, so you would just be left with 50k equals ln 2560 over 1650. And then divide both sides by 50, and if you do it on your calculator, you should get... 
And so we can say that P of T equals 1650E to the 0.0087846T. And what is the relative growth rate? Remember, we just said that was K, um, and so that is 0.88% um, per year about. So that's how much it's growing per year at, at a rate of about 0.88%. To see how well it fits a model, just graph the actual data points, and we'll also look at the model that we just found, which was 1650E to the 0.0087846T. And we see that the predictions become quite inaccurate after about 60 years. So we might try to improve the model by using the population at 1970 as our point instead of using 1950. Remember, to do this, we chose this data point. So let's say we choose this data point instead to try and make it better since we want more accuracy after 60 years. And when we do that, if we did the same procedure, you would get a K of about 0 0.0115751. And you see that this model is more accurate after 1970, but less accurate before 1950. So that's just a comparison. And this would mean what? This would mean that our relative growth rate is about 1.8%. Per year, um, you see quite a difference there, and that's just our comparison. Our next example talks about radioactive decay. Radioactive substances have been found experimentally to decay at a rate proportional to the remaining mass. Thus, the amount m, t, m of t can be expressed in terms of the initial amount m naught by m of t equals m naught e to the kt, and you'll see that looks exactly like population growth. And we can express the rate of decay in terms of half-life, the time required for half of any given quantity to decay. The half-life of radium-226 is 1,590 years. A sample of this isotope has a mass of 100 milligrams. Find a formula for the amount remaining after t years. We know that m of t is going to be the mass of R226 remaining after T years. And DM DT is just KM with the initial mass being 100. Okay, so this is just like population growth so far. So we know that M of T equals M naught e to the kt, and m naught was 100, e to the kt. And then they tell us that the half-life is 1,590 years, since the half-life is 1,590 years. We know that the mass remaining after that time is one-half of the initial amount because it's a half-life. So we know that after 1,590 years, we only have 50 milligrams remaining. And so now we can say that 50 equals 100 e to the k, and our time was 1,590. And so we have 1 half equals e to the 1590 k, in other words, K equals 1 over 1590 ln of 1 half. And don't forget that ln of 1 half is the same thing as negative ln of 2. And I just say that in case this is another one where the multiple choice problem doesn't have the answer that you're expecting. So we could also say negative ln 2 over 1590, just as a little reminder. We can say that m of t equals 100 e to the negative ln 2 over 1590 t. In part B, it says find the mass after 1,000 years, correct to the nearest milligram. And so they want the mass after 1, 
thousand years, and so we just have the initial M naught E to the K, which we just found. T, and our T in this example is just 1,000. And so we put that in our calculator, and we get about 65 milligrams because they asked us to do it to the correct to the nearest milligram. In part C, when will the mass be reduced to 30 milligrams? So when will we reach 30? 30 equals 100 e to the k, and we want to find the t such that the mass reaches 30 milligrams. So divide by 100. And so now we are going to just take the ln of both sides, so we get rid of the e. t is equal to negative ln 0.3 times 1590. I'm just multiplying by the, by the reciprocal, and I have the negative from here, over ln 2 and that is about 2,762 years. And here's just a graph of it. If we were doing this on a calculator section and we wanted to um, do part C, here is how we would have done part C on a calculator section. We just would have graphed the equation and we would have seen where the mass hits 30 and found the intersect, second calc intersect. Newton's law of cooling states that the rate of cooling or warming of an object is proportional to the temperature difference between the object and its surrounding. If we let T of T be the temperature of the object at time T and TS be the temperature of the surroundings, then we can formulate Newton's law of cooling as a differential equation, so we're saying that it's proportional to the difference between the object and its surrounding, between the object and its surrounding where k is a constant, we could solve this as a separable differential equation, but it is easier to just make a change of variable. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, let's go ahead and let this t minus ts, this difference, just be some y. Because t of s is a constant, then y prime is just equal to t prime because the constant just drops off. And so the equation just becomes what we've seen before, dy dt equals ky. We can solve this for y and then find t, just like we've done before. Don't worry if it doesn't make sense, this example will. A bottle of soda at room temperature, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, is placed in a refrigerator where the temperature is 44 degrees Fahrenheit. After half an hour, the soda has cooled to 61 degrees Fahrenheit. So after half an hour, after, let's just do it in minutes, after 30 minutes, we have that the soda has cooled to 61 degrees Fahrenheit. What is the temperature of the soda after another half an hour? So we want to basically find T of 60 here. So in example A, instead of saying that the initial temperature is 72 degrees Fahrenheit, we're going to say that the initial, why not, is 72 minus 44. So that's what I was trying to say in the last example. That's just the difference between the surrounding temperature and where we were initially. Okay, so this is going to be 28. So we're going to use that as our initial, and that's the only difference in the way we do these problems. So we have dy dt equals ky, and we know that y naught is 28, so we have y of t is equal to y naught e to the kt, which is just 28 e to the kt. What else do we know? We know t of 30 is 61. So since t after 30 minutes is 61, we know that y of 30 is just the difference between that temperature and the surrounding 
144, which is equal to 17. So now, in order to do this problem, we can just say 28e to the kt, now we're at 30 minutes, is equal to 17. And so we have e to the 30k equals 17 over 28. In other words, k equals ln of 17 over 28 divided by 30, or approximately negative 0 0.01663. And since we're cooling, we definitely want a negative here. That makes sense. Therefore, y of t is going to be equal to 28e to the negative 0 0.01663t. Now, we're not quite done because we need to say what t of t equals. And so remember that we had subtracted off this 44. So all we do is we say t of t equals 44 plus what we just found. And that's how we do it. However, they asked us, what is the temperature of the soda after another half an hour? So what was T of 60? T of 60 is just going to be 44 plus 28E to the negative 0 0.01663T, which is 60 in this example, which is about 54.3 degrees Fahrenheit. In part B, how long does it take for the soda to cool to 50 degrees Fahrenheit? Well, I'm just going to go to the next slide here to solve my equation because I ran out of room. And so I want to know when does it cool to 50 degrees? And so my equation was 44 plus 28e to the negative 0.01663t. When does that equal 50? Well, let's subtract 44. Six, and so divide. Six over 28. And so then take the ln of both sides. So we have t is equal to ln six over 28. And then I had to divide by that. And if you put that in your calculator, you get about 92.6 minutes or about 1 hour and 33 minutes. And then just trying to analyze this, what do we see here? We see that the limiting temperature is 44 degrees. And so we can kind of say that the limit as we go off to infinity of t of t equals the limit as t approaches infinity of 44 plus 28e to the negative point zero one six six three t which equals 44 plus 28 times e to the negative t as we go off to infinity is going towards zero and so we see that that does actually equal 44, so that makes a lot of sense. And that's it. That's it for our final section.